Blustery conditions couldn't keep the crowd away, but they did test the holding power of both hats and hairspray. Horses rounding the home turn were confronted by a gale force headwind, and the skills of the country's most experienced jockeys were stretched to the limit. When you turn into the straight, it's, it's a very, very strong uh, force, and it's, it's a lot of jockeys are having trouble handling it because, it, you know, you're on top of a horse travelling at 35 mile an hour, and with this wind, gee whiz, it's, it's, it's not easy today. They, they are pretty trying conditions. As the starting time for the big race drew closer, all eyes turned to the form guide. It was a quality field and it seemed no one could agree on a winner. What's going to win the Cameron Handicap? Oh, I don't know. I'm looking at uh, Baradar Boy. I don't mind you? that one. <laughs> Let's hurry. Brunch time. Brunch time. As far as I'm concerned, it's Quicksilver Cindy and that's it. The big one, Bruce or Bold Rancher. The Deneen credibility obviously influenced plenty of punters and the money poured in for Bold Rancher, which started a clear-cut favourite. Gary Harley was sticking by his original tip of brunch time, but he'd also had his ear to the door of the jockey's room. And as they raced into the home straight, Jim Cassidy proved he was a man of his word. A great win in a great race, and Cassidy has his sights set even higher. Looking at the time today, he's run 23.7, and which is only just the outside the race record, and a very, very strong wind here today. So I think out of it being a still day, he may have smashed the race record. So that's a good indication of the quality that he is. And, um, you know, I certainly think he's, he could be in a race like the Epsom right up to his ears. NBN chairman Jim Milner and wife Jean made the presentation to Quickscore's owners, who now have 68,000 reasons to smile. Successful punters had to be content with a little less. The winner paid 370 and 180. B Abel returned eight dollars even, and the local ruffy Burrandar Boy paid a handsome 1250 for third. The Quinella was worth 132 dollars 70. The Trifecta 3,093 dollars neat. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. Gold Cup can be a fair pointer to the Melbourne Cup, with previous winners Hyperno and Gurners Lane going on to grab the glamour event in the southern city. This year's Wyong Cup may provide some hints as to the winner, as the first four place getters in that race are engaged in the Cup tomorrow. But our fearless tipster Gary Harley fears an invasion from the land of the long white cloud. Bruce highlight number seven, Rural Prince, to be ridden by Jim Cassidy's brother Larry. I think it'll win one equity for second, a former New Zealander, and I've put in for third the Argentinian horse, number six, Galilei. Many students were attracted to study nursing because of the promising job prospects. On the eve of final exams, these students have been told the situation has changed. I'm um, very disillusioned. When we started, there was a surplus of nurses and we were all guaranteed jobs. But now it looks a bit rough. The Director General of the Health Department, Dr Bernie Amos, recently advised the Newcastle students of the need for them to start looking for jobs as early as possible because there might not be sufficient vacancies. I believe that the students uh, probably were initially uh, rather shocked at receiving that letter, but I think it was a very honest letter in, in informing the students of the actual situation. And the Hunter Area Director of Nursing, Margaret Marks, confirmed that fewer nursing graduates will be able to secure jobs in the Hunter next year. She says up to 42 graduates will be offered places in the region, compared with 70 last year. And to move away, like to go to Queensland or somewhere like that, is going to be really drastic upon me and my family. 
In his letter to nurses, Bernie Amos says the health department's recruitment campaign has proved effective and vacancy rates are no longer as high as they have been. He also blamed the recession for fewer jobs in the public health system. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Mayor Fairweather says his council has been lobbying for months to bring the contract to Maitland, a $70 million deal to build hundreds of buses, creating at least 100 jobs. A site at Rutherford had been selected, and according to the mayor, Maitland was the preferred option ahead of a Goulburn bid. But the announcement that Tamworth had got the nod was a complete shock. I was amazed, Peter, and disgusted because uh, at no time was Tamworth ever dis uh, mentioned in discussions. Transport Minister Bruce Baird went straight on the defensive. It's got nothing to do with Mr Tony Windsor, I should make clear. Tony Windsor, the independent member for Tamworth, holds the balance of power in the state parliament. It is in the Griner government's interest to keep Mr Windsor on side. Ray Fairweather says Maitland's bid has been taken for a ride. What do you think about Mr Baird's comment that this has nothing to do with Tony Windsor? I'm sure he said that with tongue in cheek. Adding to the controversy, Bruce Baird told Parliament it was Sir Peter Abels, the owner of the company which will build the buses, who made the suggestion to change to Tamworth. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Firefighters were thinly stretched north of the Awaba Blaze, battling a number of persistent outbreaks and heavy timber around the West Lakes region. They quickly gained the upper hand in controlling a fire which swept up to the Wakefield Road, threatening to leap across to a number of houses and farming properties. Firemen expect the scene to pose a threat well into the night. Sometimes the fears of residents were unfounded. Despite the terrifying sight of this fire at Windale late today, there was no major cause for alarm. The fire had been deliberately lit by firefighters, back burning up to the property line. So basically the properties here are safe? Yes, yes, they're all safe now and uh, the area's been cleaned out for another 12 months hopefully. Late today other small fires were being reported throughout the region. Brigades expect to be busy well into the evening. Landlocked and hobbling, Shane Powell is racing time in a bid to be fit for this weekend's Quicksilver Surf League final. As I was going to the water I trod on a sharp rock and it just punctured my heel. But um, it's pretty good, it's a nice clean little cut, even though it's pretty deep, but um, still looks pretty good for Surf League, I should be pretty good. The troublesome heel won't be his only stumbling block. A born and bred evoker boy, Powell defected to Merriweather almost three years ago. The Avoca Club will also be competing in the Surf League final series and the young Central Coaster won't be the most popular man on the beach if things get tight between the two teams. Oh, that's no problem. I've had... Because when I joined Merriweather, I surfed down here a couple of times like against Avoca, at Avoca. Um, I have a bit of a house like they pay out a bit in that, but um, there's nothing special. The all-pro Merriweather team featuring the likes of Nick Wood, Luke Egan and Simon Law will start a short-priced favourite to grace the winner's rostrum once again. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News.
The Falcons looked relaxed at today's practice session, but they had every reason to be nervous. With the exception of Michael Johnson, no player is assured of a place in the side next year. Tomorrow night's clash with the Bullets will be their last chance to impress coach Tom Wisman. We're not going to have a wholesale clear out, but we do uh, need to bring in a, you know, a couple of, of uh, other players. We need to have uh, a new look. We need to improve the team because uh, the league is improving. That won't be the only motivating factor. The Falcons believe they were robbed at Boondall a fortnight ago when the Bullets triumphed by a single point in overtime. Revenge tomorrow night would be doubly sweet. We feel that we should have won that ball game and the players feel that we owe them one. So uh, I think motivation wise it's not going to be a big problem for us. Uh, also it's the last game here at Broadmeadow Stadium with the new stadium going up uh, across the road here. So I think uh, you know it'll be a good night. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. For the first time in 25 years, the competition was held in the Hunter and in the shadows of the Lake Munmora Power Station stacks. Fifteen six-member teams from around the state took to the field to demonstrate their speed and precision in dealing with a number of mock emergencies. For the real thing, they could be called on to fight a canteen kitchen fire or switchyard blaze belching toxic gases and buzzing with 500,000 stray volts of electricity. Even these practice drills can be rugged or at least plagued with minor annoying problems. Competition is fierce with team pride on the line. Looking the part can help lift the overall game. We hope it gives us a winning edge, but it's more of a trend. But the real points were to be made in knowing how to best go about solving difficult situations in the shortest possible time. In the final wash-up, the well-drilled Araring team took the honours ahead of the Tamworth Depot squad and Vales Point in third place. Andrew Lobb reporting for NBN News. The 150 officers and airmen and women of 3 Squadron have spent long hours rehearsing for this parade and the show went ahead with full military pomp despite a howling westerly gale which dislodged uniform caps and threatened to bowl over the colour bearer. The Royal Australian Air Force is five years younger than 3 Squadron which was the first to arrive in France from Australia in 1916. Air Force top brass viewed the parade including Chief of Air Staff Air Marshal Ray Fennell. Also attending was a cross section of ex-squadron members from the past 75 years, among them the oldest surviving member, 95-year-old Harold Edwards. Harold was a watchmaker who went to France as an instrument fitter. He admits there was precious little to maintain compared to today's high technology. Very few instruments and very little went wrong with them. Mr Edwards has the unusual distinction of being the man charged with guarding the body of the infamous Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen who was shot down over Australian lines. He's a, st a stodgy looking little fellow. Uh, fairly heavy built but not a big man by any means and uh, he was very poorly dressed it seemed to me. He, uh, of course his flying jacket had been uh, taken off him but uh, he was there and uh, laid out. Three Squadron gave the Baron a full military funeral and his death sparked a debate which still rages about who shot him down. Mr Edwards says it couldn't have been the Canadian pilot Captain Brown. The angle of the bullet proves to him that it was Australian ground fire. But Three Squadron's history contains many other stories gathered from several theatres of war, including the Middle East, Malta and Italy during World War II. The squadron now flies Australia's latest in air defence, the F-18A Hornet, an aircraft which Wing Commander David Peach says will serve us well into the future. We uh, train uh, primarily uh, in the air defence role uh, to provide air defence for the country. I don't see the role changing at all.
The paediatric department's salary budget has been trimmed to $6.5 million and this would mean drastic staff and facilities cuts. Instead of nurses spending six and a half hours per patient, they'll be spending two hours per patient and that can only be to the disadvantage of children in the Hunter. And I mean, it's always very dramatic to say that children will die, but this is the sort of scenario which creates an unsafe hospital. The budget revision would also see resident and registrar overtime abolished and 30 beds axed, proposals staff can't endorse. Basically what we've said is that we are unable to provide the services that the children of the hunter deserve within the budget that's been provided. But the group is willing to compromise. It's outlined minimum acceptable standards based on an $8.3 million budget. Under those proposals, overnight beds would be cut from 48 to 31 and two neonatal cots would close. But 24-hour resident and registrar cover would be retained, along with an acceptable nurse-to-patient ratio. But even if the department is granted the $8.3 million alternative it's proposed, there's no guarantee there'll be enough beds. It works off a 90% occupancy rate, and if demand is higher, there simply won't be enough room. The department's plan is now before hospital management. If it's rejected, doctors say lives will be endangered. If that provisional budget becomes the real budget, that things will be very, very grim for children in the Hunter. And the department says there's still more at stake, the future of John Hunter as a training hospital. That will be impossible for paediatrics. Uh, this hospital also trains paediatricians. I'm sure that we will lose accreditation from the college that trains paediatricians. And uh, even more importantly is there is a threat to our medical school in that we may lose accreditation to train doctors. Neighbours noticed the fire in the woman's home at Tukley's Heritage Estate about 8 o'clock last night. The caretaker attempted to put out the fire. Our people subsequently arrived from the Tukley Brigade, extinguished the fire and um, sadly we, uh, we found a, a deceased person in the main bedroom. Police believe the 51-year-old woman was smoking in bed and the fire was started by her cigarette. This tragedy will add weight to calls for the public to install smoke detectors in homes. The equipment was checked, final touches added, and competitors gingerly took their positions. This is the longest event on the rowing calendar this year. In this regard, it's only important to get experience, to get performance, to get endurance, strength. Members of the Sydney 8 and Haberfield 4 have just returned from the World Championships in Vienna. The state coach Harold Arling was keenly recording the results of Australia's potential Olympic rowers. We've got, I would say, nearly 12 good heavyweight, men heavyweight and some good lightweights. They are really good and I think they should be prepared for next year's World Championships and Olympic Games. The men's eight was won by Sydney Rowing Club, followed by Mossman and Glebe. Jane Anderson, NBN News. After years of developing a structure more in tune with a company than the public service, the Hunter Water Board has announced it is to be corporatised from next year. Although the board will continue to be owned by the state government, General Manager Paul Broad sees corporatisation as cutting the apron strings with Sydney and giving the service autonomy. We want to have the government clearly define its role with us and us to have our role clearly defined. And in the past there's always been confusion of roles. Corporatisation will do that for us. But the employees are apparently uncertain about the boards and their own future, as shown by a recent opinion poll. Almost 1,000 staff members were surveyed. While subjects such as job satisfaction drew positive results, other crucial areas leading into corporatisation were given a colder response. 
Those surveyed are particularly critical of some senior management decisions. Only 31% agree with the general direction the board is taking and less than a quarter feel that their jobs are secure. I think it's because of the uh, situation of off the offer of voluntary redundancy and also the government's stated intention to forcibly retrench people if they don't take the offer. When you change an organisation where people uh, have a job for life to one where that's not the case, then people will feel a little bit less secure. The union representative is concerned that a poor relationship between management and the workforce in the new corporation will affect services. Uh, unless you get um, you know, full commitment from your employees, and that can't, can't be under the current state of play, unless you get that commitment from them uh, willingly, then you're not looking at the best possible outcome from your resources. The City Council has been asked to develop a policy on sun protection which could be adopted by councils across the state. You've got coastal areas, you've got a lot of sun, you've got beaches. The council is involved in many activities, leisure activities, also children's activities, and therefore it seemed important to us to pick an area that had all the things we need to develop this policy for the whole of New South Wales. There was a time when the only warning to sun lovers was to swim between the flags. Now that has changed. Australians are aware of the need to cover up, but the Newcastle City Council hopes to spread the message further. The councils of New South Wales have to be able to assist by supplying areas where people can take advantage of shade and protection from the sun. The Griner government today presented the Newcastle Council with a cheque for $35,000. It will employ a project officer who will suggest ways in which the council could help reduce the incidence of skin cancer. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Hundreds of people attended the official opening of the village. It's the result of a joint effort between the Gosford District Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Salvos. It received no government funding, instead money from a lending authority and donations paid for the facility. Prospective residents also chipped in. The complex's design and construction is aimed at ensuring the cost of resident entry is substantially less than that at similar villages. Woodport consists of 79 self-care units, 80 hostel units and an 80-bed nursing home with an additional 16-room special care wing for Alzheimer's patients. All sections of the village are joined by covered walkways complete with special facilities for the disabled. And recreational needs have not been ignored, with the village boasting facilities including an undercover three-rink bowling green, solar heated swimming pool and spa. Representatives of community welfare groups from across the Hunter met in Newcastle today to exchange experiences. Community groups have been very concerned over the last couple of years at the erosion of their funding and a lot of them are saying that they're now in crisis. The Hunter Community Council estimates that funding has been reduced by about 10% and support staff with government organisations has been pruned by about 25%. And what it means is that we're already seeing a lot of services having to turn away clients, having to reduce their hours of operation or having to cut back the hours of staff work and so on. Newcastle University's Professor of Social Work, Brian English, was critical of the recent decision to relocate the headquarters of the Department of Community Services to Lismore. If you don't have adequate support for your field staff, then your services suffer and that's one way it'll suffer. It'll suffer also, though, as I said before, in the fact that uh, the regional office will be remote from the vast majority of the people that it serves. The Hunter Community Council will produce a report detailing service cuts in the area. Jane Anderson, NBN News.
It took less than 30 minutes for the fire to tear through the weatherboard house. Investigators believe the blaze was started probably by a cigarette in a bedroom. A 15-year-old girl was alerted by a smoke detector soon after 8 this morning. When firefighters arrived, they found more trouble. Flames had leapt into the neighbouring property's eaves. Smoke also sucked in through an air conditioning vent. Firemen needed breathing gear to get at the second outbreak. A blaze was controlled in the kitchen, however smoke damage was extensive. The fire was a great shock for local residents, but while the property damage was high, no one was seriously injured.